Hello and welcome. If you're watching this video, then that means you're either interested in programming or maybe you're interested in learning game development or the programming for game development. If you are interested in game development, I have a another video that has a bit of a roadmap that tells you all the little kind of pieces to put together when making a video game. This video is just the beginning of the programming portion of game development. If you're interested in learning more about how to do 2D or 3D art or some of the audio engineering behind it, check out my other video that is the uh, the roadmap to game development. I'll put a link in the description. But that's where you would want to go first to see what it takes to kind of put together a game or at least a basic, the basic parts of a game. Uh, if you did watch that video and you're interested in beginning the programming portion of it, then you're in the right place. Or if you're just interested in learning how to program, you're also in the right place. So what I did was I made a programming course uh, for complete beginners. So this tutorial is for complete beginners. And don't worry, I will try not to make a lot of slides, but unfortunately I'm not the most creative guy in the world. So I, I'll do my best to keep it as interesting as possible. But for now, we're gonna stick to slides because that's the easiest way to convey stuff. Unfortunately, death by PowerPoint. Um, this tutorial is also hopefully designed to clarify what others don't, right? So when I learned programming myself, I read a book. I didn't have anyone to bounce ideas off of for a while. Uh, I struggled with a lot of concepts. I thought that the concepts that were explained were not clear. Uh, trying to find additional resources online was terrible in my opinion, unless you already knew programming. So luckily I had some friends who knew some programming and I, you know, they helped me through a, bu a bunch of it. Um, but I wanted to make this tutorial that it was built off of my struggles with learning how to program. Because when I first learned how to program, I also used Java, which is what we're going to do here. But it wasn't until my friend showed me how to use C Sharp and then GDScript and then uh, Python and other things that I started realizing that I knew a lot more than I thought I did and that it was way more applicable than I thought it was. So that's what I'm here to show you. I'm here to show you where I struggled. I want to kind of smoothen out those rough edges. And then where I got stuck, I want to help push you beyond that point. So you don't get stuck and you can also take this uh, information and apply it anywhere. So yes, we will learn Java to learn object oriented programming, but please understand that this is not a Java course, not really. Yes, we're going to learn Java on the way, but this is primarily be, uh, to learn object-oriented programming. So object-oriented programming is a concept. It's a single idea, well, not a single idea, but it is an idea that is implemented or used by almost every major programming language you've ever heard of. Maybe not something like assembly or anything like that, but it is used by C++, C Sharp, uh, I think F Sharp, but I've never used F Sharp, Python, obviously Java, and all these other languages as well. Java is just going to be the one that I chose to do for a number of reasons. So the first reason is that it's easy to learn. Java really does kind of make it very human readable. Uh, it's going to be our first step into things. I promise once you learn how to read and write in Java, learning how to read and write in C Sharp and then GDScript and then Python and C++ maybe, uh, it's gonna be a lot easier because you're gonna see a lot of the same patterns, you're gonna understand a lot of the concepts and that's the key thing here is that we're learning the concepts, not necessarily the language. We just kind of happen to be learning Java along the way. Uh, Java is very safe. Unlike C Sharp and C++, maybe C Sharp, but unlike C++, Java will limit the amount of memory you can use so you don't break your computer. C++, the reason people don't learn on it is because if you make a bad sector or a bad piece of code, you can literally break the program and possibly even break your computer, maybe. Depends on what the glitch really is. There's a lot of support online. Because Java is one of the primary learning languages, there's tons of support online. You can find all kinds of information, websites and stuff like that, that'll help you through learning these concepts and ideas. Java is very portable. If you want to make even just like a simple application, 
I would keep it simple on Java, by the way. But if you want to make an application that's pretty simple on either Linux, Windows, probably Mac, uh, Android, maybe iPhone. The reason I say maybe to, those, the, to Mac and iPhone is because I don't know what Apple does with their hardware and capabilities. And I think there's Java virtual machines, but don't worry about any of that. It's very portable, and that's what that means. It means you can port your program to just about anything. It doesn't mean you can pick it up and move somewhere with it. That's kind of like the first thing I remember really like, what does that mean portable? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't mean you can physically pick it up. It means that it, you can port it to anything. You can write it once and then run it on any machine. Uh, it's very powerful. Despite what a lot of people say, I still agree that, or I still think that Java is a very powerful language. Uh, just to move, prove a point, if you've ever played Minecraft, you've used Java because the original Minecraft was written completely natively in Java. So I think that was actually the point of Minecraft. I think the point was Notch and his friends wanted to prove that Java wasn't a dead language because it was losing a lot of popularity. So they made a demo that was Minecraft and it just turned out to be a huge game and it grew to be a big game and it, it still works and you can still do a lot with Java. And it's a great place to start. So as I said before, it's easy, it's safe, it's supported, it's a great place to start. It overlaps with every major language that's out there. It's got its own differences, but every language does. Um, but we're gonna learn those along the way anyways, right? The real key takeaway is to not get so hung up on the key differences, but to really focus on object-oriented programming concepts. So what is Java? Well, it's a language. It has grammar rules, which we call syntax, right? So when we type it out, we're gonna be typing to a file, just like we do like on a notepad or Microsoft Word or whatever. It has rules to that syntax or rules to that grammar, which is called syntax. It has conventions and standards. It has proper structure and it has practices that are very common in the industry. You'll notice that some of them are not required to do like the way you write a method, for example, you don't know what a method is yet, but let's say that's something that you can write out, right? There are ways that people expected, expect each other to write it, but the language is not required to use it. We're going to learn both of those. We're going to learn the standards and conventions. You are probably going to well, relearn them when you get onto the field. And if you ever become a programmer, but we're going to learn the conventions, but we definitely are going to learn the syntax because we don't have a choice. If the syntax is wrong, the program won't work. And it is an object oriented programming language. And that's why we choose, that's why we're learning it. All right, so for this tutorial, I will be detailed, right? One of the big problems I have with other tutorials, especially in programming, is I have watched so many tutorials where the person giving tutorial says, type this, type that, type this, type that, and then your program should work. They don't explain why, they don't explain how, they don't explain what you're doing. They expect, they expect you to just copy paste the code into your program and expect it to run. My two biggest gripes with that is you're not learning anything. So what use is it for you to just copy paste stuff? I'm going to help you get to the point. I want you to get to the point where you don't really need those kinds of tutorials. You can figure it out yourself where you can come up with your own solutions. You can come up with your own ideas. You can make your own programs from scratch without needing really any help. Uh, other than like obviously the documentation, but everyone needs documentation that has nothing to do with the ideas that you're using, right? And then useful later on, if you can learn them now, the reason I'm just being so detailed is if you can learn these really, really fine details now, you'd be surprised where they can come to come up and help you in the future down the road. All right, so yeah, bear with me for the first few lessons. It's not going to be the most interesting. In fact, I'd say the first four are the most boring. The very first lesson is not only the most boring, it's probably the most boring and the most difficult, but I encourage everyone to stick with it. In my personal opinion, uh, the first four lessons are the bare, 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 bare minimum to get even under remotely understand what's going on. I recommend everybody get past the first eight lessons. Um, and then anything beyond that I consider kind of supplemental and still really important. If you want to get into game development, you're going to have to go past that, right? But if you just want to like kind of learn some introductory programming stuff, lesson eight should be fine to stop at. Oh, right. So 
one kind of forewarning about this the structure of my lessons, and I have not been able to figure out a way around this. The first four lessons in particular are hard because there's a circular dependence. What that means is like the first concept we learn is going to be dependent on the second concept, but we can't learn the second concept until we learn the first concept, right? So that's, that's a circular dependence. And this actually happens a lot in programming, but it's something we're going to get very used to. Uh, I think one of the examples is, you know, I guess only really programmers would know this, but in order to build a compiler, you need a compiler. It would be like saying in order to build a machine, you first need to have the machine. But anyways, I'm going to clarify a lot of this. So that's why I want you to kind of bear with me for the first few lessons also, is because some of this might not even remotely click until we get to about lesson four, maybe five, because of this circular dependence. You can be like, why am I doing all this stuff that he hasn't explained? Or why what, I'm doing this thing, but what does it mean? Well, we'll get to it, I promise. You just kind of have to not ask questions, but also ask questions. <laughs> I know that's really confusing and strange to hear and say, but you know, feel free to ask questions in the chat, or I'm sorry, in the comments. Um, but if you kind of just, I guess, kind of not suck it up, but just bear with me and just kind of push through the first four lessons, things might start to make a little bit more sense. Okay, what will we be programming using? Or what program will we be using? Programs are built in IDEs, which stands for Integrated Developer Environments. IDEs contain, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? SDK, Software Development Kits, or sometimes the IDE is just the IDE. Uh, but the first one we're going to use is BlueJ, right? BlueJ is very simple. Uh, there's another one called Eclipse, which is actually next. But the reason I don't want to use Eclipse is because when you open it, you have to like kind of configure Eclipse. And it, there's a lot of buttons and a lot of options and a lot of this and that, that it's just clutter, right? I want to kind of remove all of that clutter away and get you to focus on the code because that is the meat and potatoes and by far the most important part about all of this. Figuring out Eclipse is something we can do later on and which we probably will do later on. So we're going to start with BlueJ. It's very simple, little to no configuration. It makes you work a little bit. One nice thing about Eclipse is it helps you write code. It can figure out what you're trying to say and then suggest it, kind of like a, like a autocorrect on your phone, but for sometimes decent sized chunks of code. BlueJ is not going to do that, but I don't want that to happen anyways. I want you to figure out, I want you to name hand write things because I think that it's going to really help you understand it if you're not having your hand held throughout the entire way. You know, maybe it's nice to have your hand held at first, but you need to kind of take off the training wheels. So we're going to actually start without training wheels. And then we'll put the training wheels on just because, you know, I want you to go faster. Let's, let's, let's move along. Uh, there's a visual layout on the program that Eclipse doesn't have. Eclipse assumes that you understand visually how your program is laid out, but BlueJ does not make that assumption. It will visualize, it has a visualization that you're going to see as we start things. Some other programs that you can use to program with for your reference. Uh, I'm actually going to skip the text editors for a second here. I'm going to skip down to Java, Dr. Java. Dr. Java is even more simplified than BlueJ is. But I think that Dr. Java is a little too simplified. You can write a Java file or a class or program, basically, but you can't really make complex packages, or it's not as easy to make packages or something. Well, you don't know what packages are yet, but it's not easy to make bigger, more complex programs with Dr. Java, in my opinion. NetBeans is really used for building GUIs in Java. You can build GUIs using BlueJ and Dr. Java, of course. I'll even show you how to do that manually using code. However, NetBeans is designed to be a drag and drop, very fast, very efficient way of making GUIs very, very quickly, right? You drag a button on the screen and then it auto populates the code in your code. Very simple to do, very easy to do. Um, we're not gonna get into NetBeans because instead of using NetBeans, we're eventually gonna go to Visual Studio. Visual Studios doesn't even do Java, but once we get past BlueJ and learning how to program, maybe we'll move on to Eclipse so we can move a lot faster and learn new concepts faster. Eventually, I do want to take you guys out of Java and into C Sharp. And that's where I really want to teach you about graphical user interfaces in Visual Studios. And we're going to do Visual Studios and C Sharp, but that's going to be way down the road. 
uh, again, for the last part, the text editors, I don't want to skip those either. Technically, everything we're doing is just being written to a text file. Like you can actually write Java code in uh, Notepad and just save it as a .java file and then it, it'll actually work. Uh, I can show you how to do that too, but the point is, if you want just a text editor, Sublime is definitely the best. Uh, I think Vim is what they use on Linux, that's the default. Notepad++ is downloadable, and like I said, Notepad. I've actually written very small programs in Notepad. It sucks because it doesn't correct your syntax or anything like that, but you can do it. Anyways, moving on. Okay, before we get into the first lesson, I want you to understand where you can find additional help. If you get stuck on anything that we're talking about here, and I can't answer your questions in the comments uh, quickly, Stack Overflow is the best place to go. My one, the hardest part about using Stack Overflow is that you need to know how to ask the question first, but that's what you're going to learn when you go through my tutorials. You're gonna learn enough to know how to ask the right questions. Um, so Stack Over Overflow is an interesting place. It's an open community where you can ask and answer questions. If you want to post questions, you kind of have to answer questions first. It's like if you want to if you want to take from the community, you have to give back to the community. It's amazing. It's but I I don't think I've other than maybe once or twice, I think Stack Overflow has almost always answered any question I've ever had. Oracle.com owns Java. They own the rights to the language and they publish it and everything like that. I mean, kind of, but the point is that Oracle.com has all official documentation. So if you need official documentation, which we're going to talk about eventually on how to use that documentation, Oracle.com is where you're going to need to go. Obviously, Google is another resource. Google is probably going to take you to Stack Overflow at some point anyways. But when you forget how to do something, it usually just leads to Stack Overflow. But if you forget something simple, there are other resources that Google will just pull up. One of them being is Geeks for Geeks. So if you do, if you Google Geeks for Geeks and then Java and then your question, you will find a very simple and informative way or informative website that describes or is related to the question that you have. I do recommend that the question be kind of relevant, like you need to have a relevancy to something. What I mean by that is like uh, if we're learning about multi-threading, which you don't know what that is yet, obviously, but let's say we're learning about multi-threading. You need to be able to do Geeks for Geeks Java multi-threading, right? But you need to know how to answer those questions just like for Stack Overflow. Uh, but other than that, Java Geeks for Geeks is still a really good way to kind of supplement these teachings. But I find personally that Geeks for Geeks does not go into great detail. It goes into detail, but not enough to really learn it, learn everything there is to know about a topic. It's very high level as we call it. All right, class one disclaimer. It is going to be the most boring lesson we do. And I mean, it's going to really be boring. It's the only day or it's the only video where we won't write code. And it is the only time I'm ever really going to make you do math. I may have you do like addition and subtraction, but the computer is going to do all the math for you. Tomorrow, or I keep saying tomorrow like this is going to be like in a day. Uh, the first class is going to be the only one where we're going to actually write out and do the math on paper. Feel free to just watch. Uh, it's going to go faster than most lessons because it's it's important for you to know, but you don't need to become masters on it. So I'm going to move pretty fast through it. Some people have actually told me that the first lesson doesn't need to exist, but I've actually used it professionally and personally multiple times so i'm still going to convey it to you guys i'm still going to teach it back to you guys plus we're here to learn everything because you know who knows when that stuff can come in handy we're not cutting any corners here and there's gonna be a lot more content than normal and again i am very sorry i'm trying to make these as interesting as possible but even i have my limits to creativity i'm not the most artistic person but that's okay and that's all i got so again, if you want to learn, if you want to see my roadmap to video game development, check out the link in the description to understand or to go see that video that has kind of like a roadmap about all the different parts of programming for, oh, I'm sorry, not just programming, but all the different parts of making a game. Uh, if you're ready to start 
learning about programming, go ahead and click the next button. Thanks.